So welcome to workshop number eight. So we've got two left to go. One of them is a really important one because one of them's going to be an exhibition of your things. So to get into tonight, welcome everyone. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about being in the dark. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, I meant it. Um, so we'll be talking about using the light you've got or changing that light so it works for you. I'm having a bit of trouble seeing my presentation tonight because it's on this screen over here. And you may notice there's a camera in the way because I'm going to be using that a little bit later on. I hope. I hope it works. I did start the meet earlier tonight to test it out and I think I got it going. So uh, we'll be talking about using Google Camera on your phone in night mode and we'll see how effective that is. We'll also be talking about using the light you've got, but also introducing some other lights. So in the uh, announcements earlier today, I asked people if they are able to turn their lights down. And I realize those of you who are in daylight time right now won't be able to do this unless you're in a dark room, maybe. So you guys will just have to watch and see what happens. But I did ask if people could bring um, a candle if they've got one and a torch or flashlight or maybe a camping lantern or something like that. Um, other kinds of lights are perfectly okay as well. We're also going to talk about what you can do to increase drama when you've got that meh sort of light because everybody gets it. Uh, we had that sort of light today where I am. And then we'll be talking about light painting and with the camera here, I'll be trying to do a little bit of a demonstration of some light painting. Now, uh, I don't have much space, so I can guarantee you it's not going to be fancy, but I'm going to have a go because if I try and get fancy, I'm going to break something <laughs> and I would not be very popular <laughs> if I did that. And we also, of course, have a special guest today. Now, the special guest will be between the session on monitoring the light and the light painting session. So make, yeah, make sure you hang around for both. So first up last week's favorite three images. Sadly, I didn't put a name on that. That wasn't very clever. So if this is your image, do you want to sing out and tell us about it? You can unmute. Hi, everyone. Hi, Paul. Hi, Ria. I so apologize for not putting your name on this. It's fine, it's fine. Hang on, you know what I'll do? Watch this. Magic of technology. If I just stop this, then I can edit. Look at that. <laughs> and of course, the next one will be just the same. That's OK. We'll pretend this is professional. <laughs> but would you like to talk about your image, please? So uh, this was from uh, this is from last December. I went on a college trip and this is a place called as the Golden Temple. So it, I clicked this picture on the Google phone and uh, night mode only. It's a Sikh temple, basically, and uh, we, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we were there for quite a time, and we lied to our teacher and went there because we weren't allowed to go there at night. <laughs> Excellent. You know, the night beauty was of this place was a must to uh, see, and that's it. Yeah, cool. Uh, now, you. as night shots go, I particularly like this one because it's got one thing absolutely right. It's exposed for the bright things, which means that the night sky is dark. And that's really important in a shot because it really conveys what that place looks like when people are looking at it. So well done, Ria. Great work. Thank you. And the next one, this one's a 360 image. And guess what? I didn't put their name on it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the first. <laughs> but this one's yours. Hi. Is it okay. Yeah, I shall so put your name on here right now. I apologize again. <laughs> it's awful of me to do that. <laughs> okay. Do you want to tell us about your image? Now, this one is a 360, so it looks a little bit funny in this flat mode. But uh, do you want to talk about your 360? Yes. Uh, this is. Yes. Uh, this photo that you. Uh... Uh, uh, click by the, uh, Insta360 on uh, Jaipur. Cool. And hey. what's the building? It's a temple, Hindu temple. It's such a detailed structure, isn't it? It's really pretty. Lots of nice shapes. Yeah, and yeah well done, Raju. 
And I'm sure the third image probably hasn't got a name on it either. <laughs> I'm doing so well this week. So whose is this one? Hi, Paul, it's me. Ah, Nita. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Oh, sorry. Um, Do you want to tell us oh, about this one? Yeah, yeah, it was taken in uh, Morocco, actually. Uh, no, we cool. were on the way, yes. Uh, it, that, that was a, a local pottery exposition, basically. They were, the local potters were doing it, and the government helped them to set up this cooperative. And I found, we took a number of photographs, but I found this the most beautiful. Yeah, I really like but it because of the, the yeah. shapes and the colors and just the way it leads yeah. into the next part of the room. It's really good. Right, and not much editing has been done. This is more or less like natural light. Yeah, very cool. Very yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I apologize again for not putting people's names on these things. It's <laughs> naughty of me. So... We've got more people coming in as well. So I'm going to start, I'm going to talk just very briefly about monochrome images because they're, they're not really appropriate for maps, so I won't get into it too much detail. But on a lot of days where it's a bit hazy or it's overcast, the light can be a bit meh. So when you take your photos, they don't look very interesting. So this one, for example, is on the, the Great Ocean Road on the coast of Victoria. It's an absolute beautiful place, but it doesn't look all that beautiful in this shot because the light's kind of crap. But the composition of the shot, I really liked it. So I changed a little bit and I used monochrome. I increased the contrast quite a lot. That brought me into an issue where all of my shadows went deep black. So I had to edit my shadows then to bring them up up higher in the greys so that they didn't look completely black. Um, and you can see that it's made a fairly dramatic sky and it's made the, the road surface and the path through the road a lot more obvious than it was when we looked at the other shot. So if I just quickly flick back to the other one, you can sort of see the difference between the two. So I personally like that. Now, you can do the same kinds of edits to a colour image, but they come out looking very artificial. So when you put a lot of contrast into a colour image, generally it doesn't look that great. But when you put a lot of contrast into a monochrome image and you really force that contrast hard like I have, um, it comes out nice and still looks good. So if we go on to the next one, this is a place called Gibson Steps and it's uh, near the rock formations called the Twelve Apostles of which there aren't 12, but that's okay. Governments lie to everybody. And, and again, this image is kind of nice, but it's not awesome. It's sort of nice. So if you change it to monochrome and boost the contrast again, you get a really striking difference. So if I just flick back and forth between them, it is actually the same image. I've moved the crop slightly as well. I also straightened my horizon because, you know, it's meant to be straight, but it wasn't that day. Oh, well, we all get that wrong sometimes, don't we? <laughs> so it is definitely the same image, but it looks totally different. Now, interestingly, this one won me a competition and the judges agreed that it looked a hell of a lot better than that one because I did actually submit both just to sort of see what happened. So well worth doing. So we get into a situation and this one starts to be more applicable to maps. Um, I've just got a question here. Always wonder what type of images to turn into monochrome. Uh, to be honest, give it a try and see how you go. Just about any image can be changed into a black and white or monochrome image. And truth be known, they're not really monochrome anyway because it's not black and white. It's a whole series of greys. So when they still get called monochrome. They still get called black and white, even though they're really grey, lots of greys. So I would suggest for any kind of image that you want to try, Go for your life. Now, in this next one, I'm going to be slightly political here. Uh, there's a, a huge movement around the world for Black Lives Matter. And since I happen to have a black image in this one, I did want to call that out that I am an ally and I am supportive. I would hope everyone is really. 
So when you get into the dark situation, so this is, you can just see them. There's a couple of bottles of alcohol there, my favourite Irish whiskey, and the gin that my wife likes to drink <laughs> sitting next to each other. It doesn't look really good, does it? And that's just a normal photo taken with the uh, the phone. So it didn't come out very nice, kind of boring, very dull. If you put a photo like that on Maps, nah, it's not great. So I just, first thing I did was I used Google Night Mode. Now, it took a long time to do this coming out of the dark, but it did actually work pretty well, I have to admit. It made a, a relatively nice image. Um, it's pretty clear and you can certainly see everything. So the technology these days can do some really amazing things that even a year ago we couldn't do. So well worth using that technology. Now this is with Google camera on the Pixel, but there are similar modes on the other phones, we, either with the Google camera software if it runs on your phone, or if it doesn't, a lot of the other ones like um, Huawei and Samsung have got their own apps that now have a night mode as well. They might not call it night mode, but it's the same kind of deal. And I'm sure they've paid their patent fees to Google. <laughs> Maybe. So the next shot I did was I wanted to add some light. So I actually used this. And I used this, this candle. Watch me burn my fingers. So I basically used a candle. Um, in the video image, you can't see a lot of light coming off this, but with a still, the still's able to gather a lot more light because you've got a longer exposure. The video is trying to do 28 frames a second, so it struggles a little bit, naturally enough, but that's okay. But you, what you will notice is that the camera light's really warm, even on, on just here on my face. It's, it's a really warm sort of color, and it brings up reds, yellows, oranges, and that sort of thing. And similarly, in the whiskey, Oops. Similarly, in the whiskey, um, it's brought up that lovely golden colour of the whiskey, which is kind of cool, just from a simple candle. Now, again, I still use night mode on the phone, but the images actually look quite a little bit different between the two. So if I just flip back and forth, if this will let me. So there's the normal night mode. The colour's not all that warm. It's I almost go it's slightly white, slightly blue going to here, suddenly you get much more warmth. So you can really see the difference in what you're getting there. But the other thing that you can see, if you look at the 1829 on that bottle, it's quite clear in the candle shot, but in the night mode shot, it's kind of gone. So just at that tiny amount of light makes so much difference. Now, this is where we're gonna get interactive a little bit for the first time. So if you're in a dark room, if you brought along a candle, um, have a look at the things around you when you've lit things up with the candle. So I did my head before, so I can light this one up again. And you're welcome to do this with me if you're in a dark place. We won't spend too much time on this because I realise not everybody's in the dark and it'll get kind of boring for the people who can't see it. But if we, for example, look at this little penguin and we take the light away from him, you almost can't see him. But you bring the light back and you start to see some quite good detail and coloration on him. Same sort of thing with the little bunny. So with light colored things, you might notice the change from the black penguin to the yellow bunny. Uh, that does actually change quite a bit. So the yellow really shows it quite well. So you can probably guess what one of your tasks is this week, can't you? <laughs> We'll get into that properly a little bit later on. So let's move on to a different kind of light source. So in this one, I've got this, which is an LED camping lantern. I wonder how this is going to look on YouTube. This can be kind of funny, I think. But this thing's really bright white, but it's got an enormous amount of blue in the light. So I don't know if you can see it on my face or not. Who are those old ghost movie games? <laughs> um, but it's very, very blue. So you can certainly see it in the image there. So if we go back and forth in this image between the candle one, which is warm and red and nicely colored, and then we go to this camping lantern, well, it's bright. I'll certainly give it that. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just have a drink. And very similar to 
the flash in your phone, this is the same kind of LED. They're called Cree LED, C-R-E-E. -E. Um, they're very bright, very white, lots of blue. And it's the same deal that you get on your phone. So if we look at our little friend, the penguin now. So uh, how handy that my phone's giving me a matching YouTube result. Thanks, Google. What you can see is this is so bright that it's actually blowing out on the camera. So it's too bright for the penguin, really. Um, and it'll get worse with the yellow bunny. So with the yellow bunny, he's almost white now, I can see in the video. So you sort of see what happens. And this is why I tell people to not use your phone light without putting something between it. So whether that's a napkin, just to bring the light down a bit, same deal. So we'll now see, see how you can see the yellow again in the bunny? So if you've got some kind of bright light that you want to try now, go right ahead and do that. While we move on to the next kind. So the next one is a flashlight. Now this particular, I won't shine it straight at the video camera too much because it'll get a bit annoying, but this particular one um, is called daylight. So it's a different kind of LED. So if I try and show the two together, um, I'm not sure how well this is going to work really on a video, but they're both very bright. I don't want to shine them directly in there, but you can probably see that the color from this one is a bit different. So it's more natural color, whereas this one has got too much white in it. So that's a daylight C-R-E-E -E LED, and it helps light things up properly where you get the right kind of expectations met in the colors of things. And it, you can see all of the detail in the bottle. You can see the 1829. You can see some of the features in the label and the embossing in the, card, in the cardboard label. But the other thing you can see is the lighting's not even anymore. So there's a, a quite a diagonal shape like that or a triangle shape to the light that's coming onto the bottle. So you can certainly light things up, but it's not even, so it doesn't work that well. Then we'll go on to the last one, which is the camera flash units, which I do actually have down here. And I better turn this light back on so you can actually see them and so that I can find them because of course they're black. So this first one is called a ring flash. This is an old fashioned kind of flash. You don't find these a lot anymore. But if you do macro photography, or if you're doing food photography, these things are fantastic, but they're hard to get. I think, I'm not sure if it was Ananda gave me this or Tony Tullock gave it to me. It might've been Tony Tullock, I think. But they also use this, this one uses this old fashioned sync cord, which fortunately my camera still supports. Not all of them do these days. The more modern variety that most people will use so ignoring studio stuff, is the hot shoe flash. This one is a whopper. Um, this flash is 180 watt seconds, which I think it's still the most powerful battery powered flash you can get your hands on. And it gets all of that light from just a handful of little AA batteries. And if you were observant there, you'll see I dropped one of them on the floor. That's okay. But you get an enormous amount of light out, them, out of them. And you've got to use them well and you've got to use them carefully using one of those things at its fullest power the 180 watt second one um, if you put that onto a model through a concentrator you'll actually give them sunburn it's that bright when you're using it in this case so this shot is the ring flash and you'll notice that there's a huge big flare on that on the top of the bottle and the bombay sapphire label that's totally ruined by the flashlight. So you've got to be really careful with flash. You've got to use it discreetly and you've got to use it away from whatever you're trying to take a picture of. So in this case, I was deliberately right up close to it because I was kind of trying to wreck the shot, to be honest. Uh, I was just having a quick look through the questions. Yes, you can buy a ring flash at aliexpress.com from Ollie. Uh, you can also get them at camera shops. So there, some camera shops will still have them and handy things to have. You can buy versions that will work with your phone and that you can trigger with your phone. I've seen some recently that are Bluetooth flashes, which I've been meaning to get one of those. And you can also get solid lights for your phone too. So 
If we want to add some other sorts of light, and you saw one of these things before, these are called poi. I don't know if you've met them before, but they're for spinning. And you'll see what I do with it later on. Um, I won't do my poi routine because I just don't have the room here to do that. Let's try and turn this thing off. But because these things have lots and lots of different, different colours, maybe if I turn this light off, you'll be able to see this better. So you can cycle through all the different colours that they can do. And sometimes when you move them, they do different colours again. That one's going back in red and yellow. That one's got reds and greens and blues, whites and blues. But you get the idea. But anyway, um, so you can certainly introduce coloured lights. Now, when you're working with camera flash, there are things called gels. It's a bit of an old fashioned concept. They're not used all that much anymore, except by pretty serious strobists. Strobists are people who use flash a lot. Um, you can change the colour of the light to be what you want. Now, you might do that for an effect. So you might decide you want a deep red scene. So you put a, a red or a purple and perhaps a blue cellophane over the top of your flash and you'll change the coloured light into be deep, really deep red. You need a lot of colour to change a flash because they're so bright. Or you can change it to make it more natural. So in this particular case, I, I would be trying to aim for some natural things. Now, when you're using these small light sources, they reflect in the bottles. So it's not a great outcome. But if you had nothing else, you could use it. So the other thing that's really handy and in your tools, so the, the three common tools that I use are my big flash, the ring flash, and a tripod. Tripod's really handy if you've got a traditional sort of camera rather than the phone. So tripods can work with the phone. You can get mounts for your phone. Um, but your phone can't do a really, really long exposure. So the absolute limit, I did notice Google camera has now gone up to a minute and a half for its longest exposure. But compared to what a, a real camera can do, that's nothing because these things can expose us until their battery runs out. And that's when they'll finally die. But mostly you do it in a few minutes. So tripod's good for keeping things steady. This particular one is a travel tripod. So it's not as sturdy as the big professional tripods that I, I use if I go into a studio or if I'm um, doing a shoot somewhere with a person. But it's fantastic for traveling because it weighs almost nothing. It's about 800 grams, which if you're carrying your carry-on luggage around, I like to take my camera gear onto planes. I don't like to put it into the hold because you've all seen those people load bags. They just smash stuff. Not to mention who's lost their bags traveling. I'm sure plenty of us have. <laughs> So if you lose your underpants, no, it's not that big a deal. You just get your credit card out and you go and buy some new ones and maybe they'll turn up eventually. But if, imagine if you lost your camera equipment. So all of my stuff is insured through a special insurance policy. But if I lose it, it's still going to take me a couple of weeks to get that money to go and buy more gear. And the way a lot of these insurance policies work, um, mine doesn't because it's actually for photographers. So it's a good one. But a lot of them, if you go and buy something to replace it, maybe you go and buy a cheap camera. So maybe instead of this one, just to tide me over for the travel, I go and buy this one, which is, say, $400, instead of buying the one that's 3000 then the insurance company will say, okay, you've replaced your camera, you've got one, we're going to give you $400. That's not cool. <laughs> so you've got to be very careful with them. Uh, there was a question about what kind of flash you can use with the phone. Um, you need a flash that's either triggered wirelessly or triggered by your Bluetooth. And there are quite a few of those out on the market. You don't tend to see them turning up in camera shops very much because camera shops hate phone cameras. Because <laughs> phone cameras take away 90% of their business. So you kind of understand why they don't like them. But you will find them on eBay. You'll find them on AliExpress. You'll find them on places like that. Lots and lots of different, different areas that you can go look for them. So I'd suggest that you just um, Google to find a supplier near you. Now, the little phone shops that you find in shopping centers will probably have them. So it's time to move on to our special guest and then we'll come back and we'll do some stuff on light painting. So I would like to welcome Anya. Now I'm going to stop presenting this and hopefully Anya can present hers. Now, I don't, know if, you, I don't know if you followed Anya on Instagram or you've seen her posts on Connect, but one thing that she and I share in common is a love of street art. And there's so much of it around the planet, and it's just really, really cool. So I thought I'd invite 
and you're along to talk about street art, how she photographs it and how she finds it. So I'm going to mute now and over to you. And if you want to start doing your presentation, if it doesn't work, then I'll present it from here because I've got it up. Great. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. And it's a pleasure for me that the poll gives me the opportunity to show you my um, passion, I guess. Let's try to check if it works. Uh, mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, is it OK? Uh, let's try. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? Oh, great. Because yes. if I have a presentation on, I can't see you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> for that. Um, like uh, Paul said, I'm really into street art uh, lately, and uh, I'm glad that not only me likes this kind of um, art. Of course, street art is a white, um, mm, white thing. It's not um, about only about murals, but um, as well as uh, it covers sculpture, uh, graffiti, etc. But today, I would like to focus only on murals and uh, the first thing I would like to share with you is how do I find murals and uh, it's mostly with the help of Google search Google Maps Instagram friends and luck what uh, luck <laughs> is that I'm just walking around and uh, the murals surprise me from time to time uh, and I find them in the places I have never expect uh, that uh, someone would like to uh, leave uh, an art like this there. So that's what I mean um, when I wrote down the luck. And uh, the friends, uh, when they know that I'm in love with murals, uh, they send me from time to time uh, their findings. Of course, I don't use their photos on Google Maps or uh, neither on Instagram. But it's great that I know, for example, that I should go to Warsaw to find some interesting uh, paintings there. Uh, I'm sure you are quite familiar with uh, Instagram, but uh, I would like to tell you how I am looking for great murals and it's um, mostly by Instagram and you can of course search by topic and I wrote down just um, examples how many posts you can find under hashtag street art, hashtag mural or hashtag graffiti but uh, for the particular place for example in Warsaw you can use hashtag Warsaw street art and if you are going to visit the capital city of Poland you will find uh, murals under this topic so you can check them first in on the internet and then just uh, find them personally in the city so the hashtags are the best uh, way on instagram to look for um paintings like that other thing yes do you know i'd never even thought of using hashtags to search for murals like that that's clever Never? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this um, uh, type of search is by artist on Instagram. And you can, of course, use the um, ad and the name of the artist, but it's tricky. From time to time, the artist um, has a different name uh, on social media. The reasons are, of course, uh, uh, different. Sometimes the mm, the name is um, is already um, occupied by someone else, uh, using uh, is used by someone else. But um, the long the longer you search, the <laughs> the best results you can get. And uh, this guy, 
I have no idea how to pronounce uh, his name, Odite, Odite, uh, but um, you can search for the artist uh, like at Odate or hashtag as well. And it's not that um, uh, hard to find him. Uh, I choose this guy because he is uh, painting uh, 3D realistic uh, murals or street art. And uh, you can see on the right side how the wall was looking before his work below and the uh, photo um, um, up the higher. Yes, it was the first photo, let's say. Uh, it shows you how the wall looked after his great work. It looks like a real ruined bath. Yeah, you sent me the, the link to this guy a few days ago and um, I spent a bit of time having a look through his stuff. It's really amazing. Yeah, especially he um, paints um, animals as well, like birds. You can see them on this uh, um, screenshot on the left. Uh, birds, I think the snakes, uh, bugs, <laughs> etc. But yeah, I really admire uh, his work. It's great. And you know the the first person who sent them who sent sorry us the profile of this guy was Isaac via our Telegram uh, channel. <laughs> so that's how I find out um, his work. And uh, uh, the mm, the thing that uh, I'm going to many places to take photo of uh, street art, it's called street art hunt. And uh, like I told you before, I uh, search via Instagram, more or less, uh, to find uh, interesting places to go to take photos of murals. And uh, from time to time, I have no idea where the particular mural is located. So there is uh, two uh, ways to find it. One is um, to use Google Lens. I take screenshot from the internet. For example, I'm going through Instagram or website and uh, I take screenshot and then I use, uh, I mark it with an arrow, I use Google Lens to get to know more about the particular art. And on the right, you can see the screenshot of the results, which Google Lens gives me. Sometimes I'm just walking around and I take a photo of a mural and I have no idea who the artist is. And I do the same. I use Google Lens to um, get more info. Yeah, do you want to say something, Paul? Nope, all right. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Google Lens, but uh, if you, you don't have it like I do in my Pixel phone, uh, in a gallery app, you can uh, download the Google Lens as a separate app. And I use it also, for example, when I'm taking the photos of uh, flowers and I have no idea what the name of the flower is, I use Google Lens. So it's very, very helpful for me. Yep. I don't know if you can see the chat, Anya, but people love your photos. No, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> so if you have any, oh, oh, I'm really appreciate. So if you have any question, just uh, Paul, you can mm, uh, read it for me. OK, because now I, my full screen is only my presentation and I can't see what you are um, talking about on the chat. And um, I will certainly do that. Um, Falguni yeah. said that now she knows how you find your murals. <laughs> she thought oh. that was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, also she said that in India that they have street art of old Bollywood actors. Um, I, oh. did, I did recently go to a, a session put on by um, Raju, who's in this chat. So you, you should have a chat with him later because he actually makes this stuff. Oh, that's great. Like Kasun and Ravindu in Sri Lanka. Yeah, they, they they like artists, not like me, just a photographer <laughs> of the street. Well, a photographer is still an artist. 
Uh, yeah, in my um, example, uh, yeah, a kind of <laughs> <Just> <laughs> like an amateur. Um, I decided to make the murals and street art more popular. So uh, besides, I take billions of photos <laughs> of murals. Uh, I try to add these murals to Google Maps. And this is an example of a mural from Warsaw. It's about um, upspring in Warsaw against, um, I guess, then German occupation. But uh, I'm showing uh, this one for you because um, if, yeah, okay, you can use Google Lens to find um, the name of the artist like I do from time to time. But if you are at the exact place um, with the mural and you can get close enough to the wall, for example, um, there is a chance you can find the name of the artist. It's usually a signature like that. So it's um, helpful. You can find then more murals of the artist you like and to follow him by uh, on Instagram, for example. Yeah, that's really it's, cool. Yeah, it's months full. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and um, it's about um, my preparation for street art hunt. Uh, I uh, make a list on Google Maps in this particular case. Uh, you can, I'm sure, find a uh, list of other people who do the same so you can use their uh, ideas but this is mine and um, it's only I zoom it only for Warsaw here and it's a private because there are a lot of mine personal um, notes <laughs> under every mula so it's uh, helping me to find it like um, next to the bar <laughs> called blah 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 <laughs> or something like this. And here is an example uh, that there is mural Chopin in Warsaw. And like a restaurant, you can rate the mural, you can write a uh, review about it. And like uh, I encourage you to do the same, you can add a mural if it's not on the Google Maps yet. But uh, please be careful with the categories. Uh, here is... Um, uh, the category is tourist attraction, and I think it works quite good with murals. But please do not mark uh, murals as art gallery, because during the COVID there was a situation that all art galleries were closed. So I found every mural marked as closed when the <laughs> art gallery was a category. So you know yeah. it took a lot of time for me <laughs> to click open, open, <laughs> open, open, <laughs> open again, <laughs> etc. So generally, I'm just kidding, of course now, but um, I think that there should be a category whatever, <laughs> because sometimes I'm really trying to find the um, exact category, the right category for, let's say, mural and i'm just getting frustrated <laughs> and then i'm like whatever <laughs> yeah we did talk about that with in one of the off sessions at connect live about categories last year and um, i did bring up that people put these things on maps and they put them on maps a lot so we really do need a category for them because people obviously want it and often the maps team want particular things on maps and not other things and murals is one of the things they don't like very much but they put up with them but maybe they just need to accept them yes i many times i wanted to add something but i couldn't find the right category i i just gave up i didn't want to mark anything um, under the misleading category so, yeah, I think tourist attractions okay. The other thing I see people use sometimes is sculpture. Sculpture, okay. In my case, I saw also that they mark it as open air museum, what is completely not relevant. Uh, because in Poland, open museum is like you know, you've got a lot of old buildings in one place, 
gather in one place and you are just like you know walking around and um, checking um, how people used to live uh, back in the past yeah i would think tourist attractions probably the nearest thing you're going to find at the moment yeah i i suggest you to to use this one it works fine and <laughs> it's not closed during the COVID uh, mm -hmm. on google maps uh, of course i uh, think that the photos uh, that you add it's like obvious uh, thing to do uh, adding a uh, morale uh, on google maps but uh, also it's very helpful for me as a street art hunter if you uh, add short video sending the surroundings also around the mural because uh, it helped me a lot to find the mm, exact wall with the paintings a week ago i was just standing in front of the murals and i couldn't find it <laughs> because it was behind my back <laughs> Guess what? Painting is a category now. I just had a look. Oh, oh hmm. okay. Um, I wonder if that's good. what it's for. <laughs> you know, I found a category in Polish that it was um, said um, promotion of art. And I was thinking about street art. Maybe this promotion of art was. Uh, especially designed for street art. Not sure. I have to check. <laughs> um, I will. I will get on to our friendly keeper of the categories, who also runs a podcast. Um, yes. And yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask him if he knows what painting is specifically for. Yeah, maybe he knows the best category for street art. Hmm, maybe. Or he'll yeah. just tell me off and tell me not to put it on maps. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to show you also um, the app, uh, my maps. I know Paul, you are familiar with this one. Oh yeah. I'm not sure what about others. Uh, I um, and it's all Ravindu's fault. <laughs> I started. <laughs> I started mapping street art. Uh, what it's really so time consuming so now uh, i've got a break from that but it's also great uh, for me to have uh, like a kind of gallery or um, diary <laughs> of my street art so you can and, uh, and don't you wish you could move things from lists into my maps and back into lists <laughs> Ah uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's problem. It's a problem. <laughs> so yeah, I have to <clears throat> make a separate my maps map here. Uh, here you've got my uh, home city with uh, all the murals marked. And uh, what I want you to know that uh, on the right screenshot, you can find uh, that you can write down the um, title of the mural and more your personal notes about it and the screenshot uh, shows you that on the left it's a uh, view picture photo from a street view and on the right side it's my personal photo that add, uh, i added there you can also do google earth tours if you oh. want to and they're, they're a new way to expose people to things on my maps because um, you can actually suck things in from a maps list to Google Earth and you can also suck things in from my maps and then you can build a tour that follows along that uh, you can go to a city and then take people around the street to the city to show them stuff. Um, oh, Yulia just great. said... Yulia just said that um, Jan said we could use cultural landmark for uh, street art. I guess we could. Yeah, that sort of makes sense. I wonder if it's available in Australia. Yeah, I have to check if it's in Polish. <laughs> oh, there is, a like... cultural, there is a cultural landmark in Australia. How about that? Hmm. I need to check this one in my uh, app. And like you, Paul, um, sent me once a photo walk uh, path uh, for uh, San Francisco. I did the same with my city uh, with the um, help of my maps app, and it's great. I was preparing meetup 
uh, not virtual, but uh, like personal meetup in Bielsko, but it was before COVID. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. yes, things happen. Yeah, yeah. The, the mind maps are really handy for creating meet, meetups and sharing them out because um, what always happens on a photo walk, there's sort of the golden rules of the photo walk, is you lose half the people in the first 10 minutes because they stop to take pictures or they stop for shiny things or they get some coffee and at least <laughs> they can find you again if they've got a map. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And um, you know what I like about it? When you send me the um, path, like uh, here, that uh, I could uh, join you whenever I had time. So, you yeah. know, if I wasn't able to join you at the beginning, I, could, um, I can easily follow you um, on this map. And of course, we, we were still in touch. Julia says the category is there in Polish. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next um, thing is um, that I would like to tell you how and when do I take photos of Moras. It's not that complicated. Um, on the left, the mural is quite simple. So, in my opinion, one photo is completely enough to put on the maps or just to, to take uh, a photo for my personal gallery and to put it on Instagram. But the mural on the right is my favorite one. It's <laughs> and huge. It's, it's huge. It's 1,500 square meters. Wow. And uh, it's beautiful and colorful and uh, my beloved surrealism <laughs> style. Uh, so uh, this one on the right, I had to um, take more photos uh, than just one then to show the details. And it's not enough. <laughs> you, could, you could take more and more photos. For example, this chameleon here. Yeah, it, it could be another painting as well. So I encourage you to take more. Uh, when it comes to when, uh, if the street art hunt is planning by me, I try to figure out where the best weather is going to be. But of course, it's not on. It, it's not only um, how to say that. I can't decide every time um, when I'm going to be in the particular city. Uh, murals with the blue sky are much better <laughs> than with the gray sky. And uh, well, they are indeed. Yeah. So if you are able to check the weather and to choose the day, it's great. But sometimes like here, <laughs> the sun is my enemy. <laughs> I was yes. walking around this mural for 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> to get the best shot uh, because the, the sunlight was direct into my camera. Uh, you've, so you've, just... you've still managed a nice blue sky there, so well done. <laughs> yeah, but I was, yeah, it was tricky, you know, to, to get the right shot. Mm, oh, when? Uh, some murals uh, are a composition of uh, things around. Uh, like here, you can see that um, the artist uh, composed uh, the um, uh, wall with the tree. So the mural uh, looks different in the winter, in spring, and in the summer, and in autumn. So that's why the uh, season is a factor here as well. Not only the blue sky, a gray sky on the on a rainy day. Uh, this is a um, is Polish artist Cora. Uh, she was a vocalist and she died because of the cancer. So I think that this art here is a kind of combination um, of showing also um, the. Um, the disease uh, that uh, she died of because of the chem chemo, she uh, lost her hair as well. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's one of the big things about art is it helps people live on longer than themselves. Oh, yes, for sure. So 
this is the kind of mix um, of art and nature as well. Like here, when you want to um, focus on the art, you need to check out if uh, this mural is not connected to the um, other, um, how to say that, this, uh, for example, on the right, you have to um, cover on the photo also the, this gutter, you call it, gutter? The, the, yep, like, the pipe. pipe. Yeah, the pipe. Yep. Because it's, the composition is like all together, because he's a kind of swinging on it. And on the left, uh, you have to check the small robot as well. And it's a part of some, I don't know, electric box in the street. So just just check if it's uh, what, how the composition work uh, together. And That's really cool. Yeah, this one, um, sometimes I just take a straight photo of the mural, but if you want to show the, um, uh, the like a kind of dimension and the how big the mural is. It's good to take a part of the surround surroundings or the side of the building. And so it's uh, easier to um, imagine how big is it. Human factor, sometimes it's a nice element. The same, to show how big the painting is and to like to show the street life, like that it's not a ghost town, but there is uh, something going on on the street. This one is particularly uh, great, uh, in my opinion, for selfies, like uh, <laughs> like Paul <laughs> showed uh, during um, his photo walk in San Jose, but I couldn't uh, be there. And it's a nice uh, souvenir, in my opinion, to have a photo uh, in front of this uh, garage. In this case, like greetings from San Jose. I don't have a really nice photo here, so that's why I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> and last thing that I wanted to show you, it's a 3D um, street art, like this guy who uh, was uh, on Instagram, his profile, two mm, types of 3D, uh, street art, this is like 3D and you have the impression that you can go inside the building, like through the wall almost. And uh, something that is quite new for me and I shared with Paul it uh, lately, that there is uh, three art murals as well, but to get the effect, you have to wear 3D glasses. So it's completely fine to take photo of the mural, but if you'd like to um, have more fun, you should take 3D glasses with uh, you as well. I think it's, it's pretty cool. I know that there is one mural in Poland uh, by this guy, Aw Awi Art, Awe Art. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure how to pronounce his um, name. And I need to go to, to that place to check it. Yeah, it looks really cool. Um, and sometimes the street art hunt uh, looks like this. <laughs> so I was a little bit too late to get the mural I was uh, searching for and a little bit too early to get a new one. But like you all know, the street art is just temporary art and it changes so uh, often. So often. <laughs> yeah. So oh, thank there's, you. That's there's a particular lane. Way. There's a particular laneway in Melbourne. So Melbourne's well known for street art. It's like your city. Um, and there's a particular laneway called Hosea Lane, which if you look at something and you walk up to the other end of the laneway, maybe 250 metres away and walk back, sometimes some of the stuff you'd looked at five minutes before is now gone and it's got new art there. Um, yeah, sometimes uh, it's sad, sometimes it's great because you can find something better <laughs> in the yeah. same place. Thanks. That's my... No worries.
<laughs> well, thank you very much for doing that, Anya. That was awesome. Thank you. If you have any questions, of course. Just... No. And just sort of a really interesting thing. I thought this is an interesting bug in um, either it's either a bug in Chrome or it's a bug in Google Meet. Um, while you were presenting, everything on my screen was in Polish. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> All my prompts and everything changed to Polish, but it's a good thing I know where they are. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I know you can't see the chat. Lots of people are, are saying thank you and they're really impressed with your things. I'm just looking through to see if there's any questions about the street art. And it, I can't see any actual questions, but lots of people really enjoyed your presentation. So that's really cool. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And as someone just said, you've got a mural of your own. There you go. <laughs> In your slide. So if you want to uh, connect up with Anya, there's her connect name. And there's, there's two Instagram accounts there. The one on the left is Anya's personal account. And the one on the right is a new one for Street Art Heaven, which is only got street art. So if you, it, it's a bit like me, I guess. I, I've got three Instagram accounts. If people don't want to look at what I had for breakfast and um, want to have a look at my Lego, they can have a look at that. Or if they want to see what I do as a people photographer, they can do that too. So it's good to have multiple, multiple outlets and channels. So we'll move on. So we're going to get into light painting now and that one that you can see there was done during Connect 2018, I think. Yes, 2018. And a couple of people came and helped me to do that. One person was helping me stay in the right line, and I'm just looking for my battery pack, which I can't, there it is, can't find. Um, one, one person was helping me stay in a straight line, walking along next to me, so I didn't fall into the water. And the... Um, other person was standing with my camera because uh, while San Francisco is a really cool city, don't leave your camera by itself. It's uh, one of those interesting places. So this thing, which I imagine you can sort of see, this is the tool I use for doing great big painting like that one. So it's actually the wheel off a wheelchair, believe it or not. I got this one because it's made of plastic, which means I can take it on planes. Um, and it, when it powers up, it gets lots of cool colours. So it's it just pulses through the colours. So that that's how the coloured writing happens. And basically, you just move it during a long exposure, so you can write letters. So you can do an L or a G. Now, the really interesting thing about using this, and I'll just sit here with creepy lights under my face now. The really interesting thing about writing in these long exposures is you have to do it backwards. You have to do the letters backwards. Because if you don't, um, they'll come out backwards on your image. Of course, you can fix that in post if you want to. But if you want the background to be the right way around, then you need to learn how to write backwards. It's not that hard, to be honest. What's hard is getting the spacing right. So on that one, I was a little bit crowded in because I had so many letters to get in into that short little space that I had. So I had to crowd it up a bit. Now, there's other light painting things that you can use as well. I might come back to that one in a moment. So this one is, it's actually one of those poi that I showed you before running in its flame mode. So it's like a candle when it's running in flame mode. Um, it looks like there's a whole lot of things turning up in the chat. I'll just check and see if there's any questions. Uh, one person wanted to know, Anya, was that your name on the wall? Uh, yes, that was. It's not. I did ask Anya about that. It wasn't her name specifically. She <laughs> just found it and used it. You should tell people it is your name. Who's going to know? Yes, I, I I wrote down the answer. Yeah, that Anya is the most popular name in Poland, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't really like this fact. But that's why I could find my own mural. mural. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't created for me. It's, it's plenty of Anyas in Poland. Yeah. Well, you can just be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. So if we look at the, the light painting thing, this one with the uh, poi in its flame mode, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of a labyrinth or not, but a labyrinth is a little bit like a maze, but not quite. You walk in on a path and you go all the way around the labyrinth and until you get to the end and the path never overlaps. There's only one way in and you have to walk all the way in and then walk all the way out. It's the only way to do it. And it came out kind of nice on this one when I did it at night time. So this next one, I am definitely not going to demonstrate to you inside because I would set fire to my house on that particular night and almost set fire to my kid. Um, <laughs> that's steel wool. So it's that same stuff that you scrub your pots and pans with, but it's a lot of it. That particular one there is about a kilo of steel wool and you form it into a ball. You need to secure it into something. Um, I use kitchen whisks for when I'm doing it and you basically spin it around over your head and the sparks and the gobs of steel fly absolutely everywhere. Um, that one is on top of, ironically, a fire tower. <laughs> so it came out really cool. Um, I've just got a question from Devonish there. There's a couple of others. He's asking if I used any filter because it took me a while to write all those letters and the image is not blown out. Now that's an awesome question, Devonish, and I'm going to show you something in a moment. And I'm sure this will give an a little grin. Um, I'm going to show you why DSLR cameras suck and why you should get a mirrorless camera because only mirrorless cameras can do what I'm about to show you. <laughs> so yes, that is a, it's a good segue into what I'm gonna do in a couple of minutes. This next one is um, fire again, but it's a different kind of fire. So it's the same kind of poi as these, except that instead of being a little light up blob, like these ones are, so I don't know if you can actually see in there, but there's a, a battery and a light in there. So these ones, the, the ones I used here actually burn. So you um, put a, a chemical solvent, a flammable sample solvent. Um, some people use kerosene. The solvent's downside is it's carcinogenic. Kerosene's downside is that it will kill you with carbon monoxide. So, you know, you can have one or the other. You choose cancer or you choose not being able to breathe. That's okay. Um, fire is really cool to play with, but you need to be a little bit careful with it. I still have a beard, but I almost lost it one night. I lost, uh, which side is it? It's this side. Um, on this side, my beard's actually thinner than this side and it has been ever since the night that I hit myself with a fire boy. Such is life, huh? The things you do for art. So you'll have to bear with me in a moment. I'm just going to stop this presentation and I've got to fire up another screen and I really, really, really hope this actually works so let me just put this meet up onto my other screen because the only way i can make this work is to share the whole screen because this software is shit but that's okay so i'm just going to stop presenting and i'm going to share another screen now and i have to share my entire screen hopefully i get this right so I'm now sharing the software that can control this camera and I've just got to get the camera into the right sort of mode to do what I want to do. Where's the button? There it is. Okay. Now we just wait while Windows figures this thing out. Yay! It worked. So what I'm going to do is just show you a couple of simple things. I'll start with the, the big wheel. Now, I'm not going to do anything fancy because, like I said, I don't have much room here. And I'm not going to be able to talk while I'm doing this because my microphone won't reach that far. So I'm just going to kill this light. Now, before I do it, let's do the setup shot. So when it's running, you can see here it's called composite. This is a particular feature of Olympus cameras called live composite and you set up an initial base shot which takes the first image now i've actually set up the configuration for this so that this image will come out pretty dark and i'll just kill this light because i don't really want the things in the background in this shot but it's taken the first shot now and you'll notice that down here it's saying it's ready for a composite start so it's still exposing you can see my hand there but it's not changing the image yet so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on 
composite shooting. And this is where mirrorless comes in. And you can see that there's a little bit of change happening there because I just moved away from the monitor. Now I'm just gonna take this off and I've got to take the microphone off now and stop talking and I'll just go and draw with this big colored wheel. So I'll just, I'll just stop that one now. So you can see that little image that turned up down there. And I'm just going to kick off another one because I'm going to try and do something a little bit silly. So let's just see how this works. So that just sort of gives you just a little bit of an idea of some of the stuff that you can do. So I'll just stop that one now. Um, hopefully you guys can all see that screen happening there. And I'm going to do one more. And I don't know how well this is going to work inside, but what I'm going to try and do um, is create a ball, a ball of light. Now I'm only going to use the poi. So let's see how this goes. Could be good. Or it could be crap. Well, that one came out kind of crap because I hit the cupboard halfway through. <laughs> I had the string a bit too long. So let's just let's just try that one more time and see if I can get it right this time. So I'm just going to start the composite shot. That one worked much better. It's still not exactly a perfect ball, but that's because we're not outside. So I'll just pop the light back on now and I will go back to the presentation now. I'll put this back up here. Excuse me while I shift things around on monitors and then I'll get to your questions. Now, um, and then just, just putting in a, a how you do some of this stuff. So he's been looking after the questions for me. Thank you, Ananda. And I'll just start presenting again because it's kind of useful if you can actually see what's happening. Kind of helps. So that's called light painting. Um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different ways to do it. And of course, I was being a little bit mean to say that DSLRs are crap, but um, they can't do that kind of shot. You can certainly do a long exposure to do light painting or whatever. So if you're out in the dark, that's going to work for you pretty well. There's no real reason why you can't set up, say, a 30 second or a 60 second exposure in a nice dark place with your standard camera and go and do those things. But the mode I was using on the Olympus is quite clever. Now, what you probably saw is I took two shots, not one, but they're blended together. And the Olympus is actually blending a whole lot of different shots all into the one while it's doing that live composition. So it's called live composite. And what it does is it takes samples from the sensor and it blends them together in camera so that you don't have to do it later on in Photoshop. And instead of seeing, you may have seen on the webcam while I was doing that, you can probably see the light bulb just flashing and you can't really see what the trails are terribly well. But 
as the camera gets it and it starts adding all of those different things together, it starts making cool shapes. And that's where you can start to do writing and you can draw things. And I mean, Ananda's seen me out on photo walks at nighttime where I start doing things like sheep and giraffes and kangaroos and sometimes rude words. <laughs> They're, they're, they're particularly funny if you've got all these families watching you do it because they have absolutely no idea what word you're writing. <laughs> they just can't tell. So it's just kind of funny. Now, there's a whole bunch of things going into the chat. So let me just hop out here for a tick. Um, Shri has asked, uh, what is the software in the camera? So in my particular one, this is an uh, Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. You, this is a pretty high-end version of Olympus stuff. You don't need this one. The, the OMD EM5 definitely has this mode. I think the 10 does too, doesn't it? Enter the, the entry-level one. I'm not sure about that. Um, I I'll think have... it does. I think it does. Mm. I think I've used it on the 10 because I've also got a 10. Um, it's got live time, definitely. I don't know whether it's got live composite. Yeah, um, they're a little bit different. Live time will, it's like a normal long exposure that you take with any camera, except for one critical difference. When you're doing a long exposure, normally the display on the back of your camera goes quiet. You can't see anything. Live time, it takes periodic samples from what it's building up on the sensor and actually shows you what the image looks like so you can decide when to stop exposing it, which is really, really clever stuff. And as far as I know, only Olympus do it. I haven't seen it turn up on any other cameras yet. Oh, I, well, I don't know whether Sony does it. Um, yeah, Sony's, like... Sony's got a thing like live time. Quite a few things do that. Yeah. But um, I don't think anyone else is doing live composite yet. Mm, you're right. And, it, and maybe they patented it and won't let anybody else do it, which wouldn't surprise me very much because it's a, it's a good selling feature for their stuff. So normally I don't push brands, but on this particular one, I love that feature because I like doing light painting and it's just awesome because when you're using long exposure with a traditional camera with a DSLR or one of the other ones that doesn't have this mode, um, what's happening in the background is the background's getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter until the point that the background becomes distracting and annoying. Um, and you can also build up a lot of noise in your background, which the, the Violi doesn't seem to have that issue. Mm, so right. Ananda's put some good um, discussion sites about live composite mode into the chat, which is handy. Now, coming down to this week's task. Now, let me find my notepad session, wherever I did with it. I'm going to find it. There it is, because I will paste the album back in. Oops, didn't want to cut that. I wanted to paste that. So it's a good thing I can just do that again. That wasn't very clever, but I'll just paste into the chat again the album for tonight's tasks and the feedback form again. So they're both in there now. Now, tonight's task, as you can probably guess, is I want to see where you've changed the light. So whenever it gets dark for you, it doesn't have to be completely dark, but a little bit dark, uh, what I want you to do is take an object in your home and I don't want you to go out for this one so don't worry if you're still locked in. Victorian sadly our restrictions are back yay. <laughs> we, we've had a little bit of a spike in in cases so our government's reacted by restricting us again not not completely we're still allowed out to some extent not as much as we were yesterday though <laughs> that's life but take an object so um, I could example use Use, use my Dalek <laughs> or you could use um, something around your home. So whatever you happen to find and use some light. Start with a candle if you've got one. Try not to burn down your house though. Please don't burn down your house. <laughs> so start with a candle. Try a flashlight or a torch. And if you've got some other coloured lights, you can try those. If you don't have coloured lights, find yourself some coloured cloth. So Rhea, for example, I can see you've got red curtains behind you. Um, if you shine a light through those curtains, you'll get a red tinge to the light. So just try some different things like that. And I'd like you to share two or three photos of your experiments into the album. And that's a, I think that'll be fun. It's just a good fun thing to do. Now, it does still tie back to local guides a bit because if you think about it, when you're in a restaurant or a cafe, 
it's often dark. So this is going to teach you some ways to play with light so that you can take better photos when you're in places like that, because you'll start to understand light. And one of the really interesting things that you find yourself doing as a photographer, and this is the day that I would suggest to you that you can call yourself a, a photographer. And painters and other people that work with light find the same thing. You'll walk through the world and one day you start to see it differently. I know it sounds corny, but it's actually true. You really do start to see the world differently because you start to see light and shadow and you start to see colors and you start to see how to frame things. You start to see shapes. And that's where you start to get good at composing your photographs because you're starting to see that stuff. Before then you're following rules and that's why those rules exist. And then one day you come to the realization that you start following, you'll still follow the rules, of course, because they're automatic, they're sort of things that are there and they make sense. But you'll start following more complex rules in here and you won't even realize you are because you're making up your own rules now and you're making up your own compositions. There's some really, really good books on composition if you want to follow that up. Um, Michael Freeman is a, a photographer that writes quite well on composition. He's one of my favorite authors on it. Um, so I will find some links for some of his stuff and, and put it into the recap for this one. But there's a, there's a lot of other books on composition and don't stick to photography books. Don't go out and look at one of those famous photographers and copy what they do. You'll work out something for yourself. A lot of people say you get your own style. I can kind of see that, but kind of not. There are things that I like to do. So if that's my photographic style, okay, that's fine. But there's a lot of things I like to do. So I don't have one way of taking photos. And people who follow my, me on Instagram will see one week I'm sharing pictures of an abandoned building and the next week I'm sharing pictures of a protest and the next week I'm out in the street taking pictures of people and the next week I'm doing photos of Lego or whatever with toy photography and making scenes that way. It's just because there's lots of stuff I love to play with and you can't do it all at once. So you sort of do one and then you do something else and then you do something else. And, and then you find modifiers like the um, glass balls and crystal balls and things like that. They're good fun too. So we'll get, you'll start to play. You'll just love to play. And I think that's what a lot of it's all about. And that's really how you learn this stuff. So we are in week eight and we've kind of reached the end of week eight. So we'll, we'll open up for questions in a moment. Next week, we have got another session. Now, we've actually covered all of the topics that I was going to cover in the nine weeks, in the eight weeks. So things got shifted around a little bit because it made sense to move things around. So I don't actually have any topics for next week. So if anybody's got anything that they'd like to know, um, send me a private message on Connect and we will try and cover the things. Um, Maria's just asked a question about silhouettes and how to do settings, etc., on a DSL, DSL camera, or I think you mean a DSLR camera, single lens reflex. Um, the silhouettes are relatively easy to do. You need a really bright light be behind the thing that you're photographing, and you're going to be facing that light. So if you expose for that light, the thing that's between you and that light will be in shadow. So if you think about the, the people who were lucky enough to see the annual, annular eclipse of the sun yesterday, I think it was, if you were in one of the areas of the world where you could see that, we weren't. Um, that one, the moon was hiding the sun and you could only see the outskirt of it. So you're seeing a silhouette of the moon. You're not really seeing a big hole in the sun. You're just seeing, you know, Shreya saw it today, which is really cool. Um, I wish we'd been able to see it here. I've only seen it once in my lifetime. And I'd really like to see another one. But what you're not seeing is a giant hole in the sun. So it looks, the sun turns into sort of this fiery donut. And what you're seeing is a silhouette of the moon, but the sunlight is so bright, you can't see the moon anymore. So you can't look at it and see that there's features of the moon there. And the silhouette of a person or a, a tree or whatever is the same concept. You're exposing for that really bright light. And when you expose to that really bright light, the thing you put in front of it goes kind of black. So if I get just this simple desk lamp that I've got here, and if I put my hand here, my hand's pretty bright. But if I put my hand around here, I'm not sure if it'll actually work on the webcam or not. Maybe, maybe not. 
Uh, hand's still pretty bright. I can see it in the web image, so it's not really working on the webcam. But you see my hand's a little bit more shadowy there than it is there. Here it's quite quite featured as a hand, and over here it gets a little bit shadowy in the middle. That's basically the effect you're looking for, and you want to expose to the bright thing. Similar to photographing at night time. So I'll just talk about our exhibition, which is week 10. So in week 10, what I want to do is get everybody to submit a couple of photos. And I want them to be photos that you have made during the nine weeks of our workshops. So I don't want people to get me one that they've got earlier. So it can be on any of the things from any of the workshops. And it can be from any any of the different genres we're talking about. So whatever you want to do. If you want to take pictures of outside and you're desperate to do pictures of outside and you can't go out, um, in that case, please do share old ones because I don't want you to go outside and put yourself in into any kind of danger because I know a lot of areas in the world right now are in very tight lockdown. I know most of India is, for example. Um, you simply can't go out and not, not for something like making art. It's just not worth your life and the life of the people around you it's don't do it so and those people if you if you don't want to do something that's inside your house and you really really have got a favorite image from outside that you want to share please share that one but i would prefer that it was something you did during the workshops um, in the feedback form there's a question in there today of whether you're interested in taking part and it's just a yes or a no you don't have to give any more indication than that what i intend to do for the exhibition next week is I will share two things next week. I will share an album, which is, I'm not sure if I'll actually do a task next week, but I'll share an, an album, which is for the exhibition shots. But I'll also share a form where I want you to talk about the photo a little bit. And then I'm going to organize them into an exhibition. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to make that work just yet. But I'm hoping um, to bring in a couple of extra people so that we can talk through the images and each person who's made an image will get to talk about it and then we'll talk about the images as well and we'll talk about the the positive things in in each of those images so has anybody got any questions on anything from tonight and feel free to unmute now and ask your questions i'm going to stop presenting so that we can see you in the video or if you want to add anything about uh, composite mode, Ananda, go for your life. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll defer to anyone who wants to ask questions first, and then uh, we'll, we'll fill in with some composites uh, later. Cool. So has anybody got any questions from tonight's session? I know there were a bunch in the chat. I think I got to all the ones in the chat. So if I didn't, just sing out now and I'll, I'll happily answer it now. Oh, Andrew's Hello, asked, Paul. Andrew's, just before we get on, yep, yeah, well, it's you actually who have had to ask your question, uh, aren't you? <laughs> you, you? You can go ahead and answer that one oh, that I wanted to Well, the, the, the question that you asked in the chat, let me just get the chat back up. Is there a software that can enhance the flash in your phone as in the internal flash that comes with the phone? Um, not really, that's <laughs> the answer to that. There's lots of things that claim they can, but you can't really change the physics of the light that's coming out of the phone. So did you have any other questions, Andrew? Uh, noise. <laughs> that works pretty well. <laughs> Um, what you could do with your phone, you can um, use something to change the light. So you can certainly put little colored bits of plastic over the flash and that will change it. Usually with a phone flash, there are very bright, very white, very blue tinged LED. So putting a little bit of orange or a little bit of red might help. But you'll have to experiment and find out what the right shade to use is. Um, I have got my camera bag here. What I'm not sure is whether I've got the thing I'm looking for in my camera bag. 
Maybe I do, maybe I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, you look, maybe I can entertain our... our sure, our... that would be good, Ananda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, Live Composite is uh, a new tech that uh, Olympus uh, started. Um, um, so let me go back to the classic way. So the classic way to take a photo of something at night uh, is that you open the shutter, you open the shutter, so the shutter is closed, you open the shutter and light comes into your cam camera, to your sensor or to your film, um, and light keeps on coming um, and you stop the light when you close the shutter. Um, when that happens, um, you get um, some bright things become too bright uh, and the dull things or the dim things take too long to become clear enough for you to see. So that you can do with any camera. Uh, what Live Composite does is, uh, the first thing is you can see the exposure live, like Paul was showing in his demonstration. So uh, in the older cameras, uh, DSLRs and all that, uh, when you click uh, the shutter uh, on, the, on the camera and it's a three second or five second or 10 second exposure, you can't see anything. The, the camera is uh, receiving the light, you can't see anything at all. When you stop the shutter, only then can you see the image. And so you can't see anything when you're actually taking the photo. And the, the next Im improvement was uh, an idea called live time. And with live time, because this is a digital uh, camera, um, when you open the shutter, um, the camera is collecting light and uh, Olympus and, uh, was the first company to say, if the camera is uh, absorbing light, maybe we can also show the light to the person. And so that's called lifetime. So you can actually see the image becoming brighter and brighter uh, as the photo is being taken. So if you see that it's becoming uh, a little bit too bright, stop it. And, and you, you, you've got the right, color the right exposure. So that's called live time. Now live composite is uh, a, another improvement. Live composite, what happens is the first uh, exposure it takes, it takes a picture of uh, the scene as it is, which could be quite dark. Then every uh, duration, every half second or every one second, it takes a frame, it takes a frame, it takes a frame. So as it takes a frame, it takes uh, the, 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 the light for only that frame. And then the camera intelligently uh, composites all the frames. So every frame is blended with the next frame. And it, with, that, with that idea, your brightest uh, parts of the scene don't get too bright. Um, and it gives the chance for the darker parts of the scene to 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 come to the color that you like, so that's roughly it. But the articles will explain a, a lot more. Over to you, yep. Paul. Cool, thank you, Ananda. That was really useful. Um, interestingly enough, for many, 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 many years, Ananda watched me carrying around my big heavy cannon and goes, "Why don't you change to one of these little things?" And do you know what finally swung it for me? It was live composite. The first time I saw that happen, I thought, "I need one of those cameras." <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the Andrew, you were asking about changing the light. So this is a little pack of things from a, a group called Strobist. Now there are um, these people are best. I, I'd describe them as a club, maybe, but they're, they're not really a company. But what you get is these little bits of cellophane with different colours, and they get darker and I think I might try and show you these on top of the light so that might work a little bit better um, I can this light might be too bright actually it's too bright that one has an effect let me see if I can find a less bright light to do this with <laughs> I didn't think that through too well did I bet this one on its less bright mode how well does this work I've got to be a little bit careful to keep these in order because they actually match up to things. Um, so that one, there we go. 
you can see that. So if I turn this light off, um, you can see how it's bright. And then when I put this one over it, it gets a little bit darker. So that's just a dark gray gel. These are called gels. Um, and then I can bring in another dark gray one. Well, someone's getting into the TV in the background. And you can see this one's a little bit green. And you've got, uh, let me just cycle through till I can find one that'll show up well. There's one. I'll sort these out later now. So these ones introduce some red into the image or into the, the color. And you'd be able to use these with your phone. Um, I've used them with flash in photographing people and I've used them in creative scenes. But they're really handy when you're using them with flash because it changes the colors. So I don't know if you can actually see these or not particularly well, but they're, they're the sets of colors that you get just with this kit. Those, yeah, uh, at least uh, I can see. I can see a bit of different colors there. Yeah, and they don't cost very much. And when you're using them with a, a flash, let me turn the light back on. When you're using them with a camera flash, let me take one that you'll be able to see. So if I use one of use these dark blue ones, most flashes have a little screen that you can pop out. They just slip in underneath it, <laughs> literally just like that. So you can see the cellophanes there. And when the flash goes off, it changes the color. Now, if you're looking directly at the flash, you probably won't actually notice that the color changed very much. And same with on your phone, you probably won't be able to see it. But in the photos, you'll certainly see it. Um, now, one thing you probably will have to do is phone, maybe not so much. Phones will probably cope. But in, in cameras, normally you'll have to force the white balance because if you use automatic white balance, which most of us just leave it set on automatic white balance, it'll get a little bit confused with that colored light usually. So it, it'll try and try its best to bring it back to a white light. And that's not really what you want because you want to change the color. <laughs> So they're handy. Are there any other questions? I can see there's a few. Oh, hello, a few Paul. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask about the, uh, have you ever tried about the fairy, with the fairy lights photo shoot? Like yes. the smaller and the tiny ones. Like how to use with that? Because I've seen so many beautiful photos with the uh, models and everyone. They like, they blur the uh, away for, fairy lights and they literally focus on the tiny bits which are nearer to the face or the object like is that something related to the light um, photography yeah it certainly is so in those ones they're usually using the light from the fairy lights themselves to light the image and they're exposing from the light that the fairy lights create where you see um, those fairy lights surrounding a person and the person is their whole body is really nicely exposed you'll probably find that that's most likely one of two things. It's either two images that they've composited together afterwards, or they've used the exposure from the fairy lights to get most of their image, and then they've used a camera flash, and they've fired that off with a fairly low intensity to expose the rest of the body. So um, you saw me before I was painting with the light with these things and the big wheel. That also works with the, the things like the fairy lights and the white lights. So you're not so much photographing the lights themselves. You're photographing the, what the light has done, what the light's falling on. So the light comes from a source and it goes somewhere. You're capturing the spot where it goes. So I'm probably not explaining that all that well. So let me just grab an object. So if I get this torch out again, and this one does have a fairly, yeah, there we go, it does have a fairly directional beam. So um, hopefully you'll be able to see this. If I turn this light off, it might help actually. So if I was to run the torch over this object while I'm exposing a photo, you'd actually see the object start to appear. Um, I wonder if I should fire up the live composite thing again. People want me to do that, it'll take a little while. And then maybe I can show you what I mean. Yeah, there's a couple of people nodding. 
<laughs> All right. I shall fire this thing up again, and I'll see if I can actually show you what I'm talking about. So just bear with me a moment. I'll just turn this around so I can see what I'm doing. And I will move the meetup over onto the other monitor again, and I will present the Olympus software again. Okay, so I'll start off a shot and I'll start the composite. So hopefully this light won't be too big. Let me just filter this down a bit with something else. So I don't want to make this light too big. There we go. This will be a nice dim light now. So I've got my object here, which you probably, it won't focus all that well, but Oop, that might be a bit too much light. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're going to see the actual object or not. Doesn't look like my idea is working that well right now. There we go. So you saw it. I, I painted in the background as well, but you saw how suddenly the light appeared. So maybe if I find something a little bit bigger. So there's a tissue box. So I'll just start another one and then I'll use this. So I won't use that because it's not dark colored. I will use this drink bottle and I will start another one. Do the first shot and start the composite now. So I've got this drink bottle and the composite running, it is. So if I start, just start bringing the light up the bottle and you'll start to see the bottle appear soon. There it is. Sorry about the focus, it's a bit shit. But you can see how the bottle, more and more of it's being revealed. And you can see a light that was painted on the on the cupboards as well. So that might actually be a good way to show this too, because you can see that vertical line that's gone up through the cupboard there. But if I start painting on the other doors, and then that one, and then that one, and then that one, and now I'll paint the cat. <laughs> you can see her down there. And then that door. And then that door, you can certainly start to see what I'm talking about where you're painting in the light. So it's not just about capturing the light that's shining like we did with the big coloured wheel, but you can paint by drawing on your background as well. So I'll just kill that one and I'll stop the screen sharing now so we can see each other again. So um, that technique where you're painting with a torch um, who's seen those really beautiful pictures of the sky done at night time where you can see a huge field of stars? I don't know how many people have seen those. I, I've seen quite a few of those. I make some of those. Um, just while we're chatting here, uh, let me just quickly see if I can find one in my library. Uh, there's a particular one I'm looking for. So excuse me while I hunt, while Lightroom warms itself back up again so I can search. Come on. Lightroom goes to sleep. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. I'm looking for a particular image. And I bet you I won't be able to find it. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe I should actually, no, I've got it straight away. Let me present the screen. This will be handy. So I'll just put the meetup back over here again so I can see this and I can see you and I will just present window. So I'm going to present Photoshop or oh, Lightroom rather. So in these shots where you can see the night sky, so this, there we go, you can probably see that now. So this one's not the best example of it, but this is where I was starting to learn this stuff and I was starting to paint with the light while I did the stars. So uh, let's go and have a look at this one. This is probably a fairly good example of it. So I've got the night sky stars in the background and I've used, actually it was that torch, to paint this building. And inside, I had a big red light inside the building. Um, 
similarly with this tree, painted the tree with the torch and the building and you get those nice stars in the background. So that's painted the same way I painted the cupboards just before. So that's a way you can change light and you can start to experiment and play with that. You can do that with normal long exposure. You don't need particularly the Olympus features to do that. Are there any other questions tonight? People seem pretty quiet. Oh, Devonish has asked if we can add clicking the Milky Way as part of the next session. Yep, I'm sure we can manage that. <laughs> um, it's not a really difficult thing to do, so uh, don't don't think it's hard because it's not. The the only challenge that you will have in photographing stars is working out the focus, because you would think that when you you'll have to manually focus your lens and. I'm not going to say you can't do it with a phone, but you can't do it with a phone. <laughs> not really. Um, the hardest thing is focus because you'd probably think that the stars, you just focus at infinity, but it doesn't actually work. <laughs> so you need to find a way to focus on the stars. I'll, I'll cover the technique that I use next week. It's not really difficult, but the brighter the lens you've got, the easier you'll find it because it, it is a bit challenging to do these things in the dark. Um, now, if you want to photograph the sky and stars, so I'll cover this a bit more next week, but you need to be somewhere that's really, really dark. So we've got a few people dropping out now. It's probably because we've run 45 minutes over time, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll get into the stars and stuff next week, but you really need to be somewhere dark. So if you try to do it in a city, you probably won't get a lot of detail in the sky simply because the lights in the city are too bright for it and you'll end up photographing that instead. It, it's a bit like um, you've probably seen telescopes near cities that aren't used anymore. That's the same reason. There's too much light. Nita said not possible in Delhi. Yeah, I'd believe that. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, we might wrap that up for tonight then. And next week, stars will be on the agenda. And we'll see what else people come up with in Connect. If people don't come up with stuff, I'll just make something up. <laughs> I'm sure we can find something to do. Uh, we had, st can you put street art into the album floor tonight? Um, I'd rather not tonight, but in the exhibition one, yes. You could put street art into that one. So tonight's about changing the light. So I want you to find an object in your home and use different light sources to try and change the light on that object. So I particularly want you to do that because I particularly want you to start learning about controlling your own light because it's an important part of photography. I'd actually say that controlling the light or at least understanding the light is probably the most important part of photography because until you start to get an idea of how light works, um, you will just be fairly mechanical in your photographs. So you start to need to, you really do need to understand light, not on any great scientific level, but just what it does to things. But anyway, um, there don't seem to be any other questions. So I think we'll wrap that up here. And thank you very much for coming along. Um, we're down to about 18 people, so we can still do the local guides thing. So if you all want to unmute now, Yes. So on the count of three, we're all going to say local guides. We all ready? One, two, three. Hello. Well done, everybody. All right. Well, we shall see you all next week. And um, please get hold of me on Connect if you've got any particular things you'd like right. to add into next week's workshop. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, good guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Enjoy your week. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs> see you later. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Day by day, the tasks I are getting like interesting. Hi, everybody. Day by day, the tasks are going very interesting.
<laughs> Every week they are. Fitting sometimes just, people put yeah. things in for the tasks and sometimes they just put random photos in. Which, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, you guys enjoy yourselves and I will see you all next week or we'll chat during the week on Connect. Yes. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye.